All right, so yeah, uh, by way of introduction, uh, I'd like to start by introducing myself. Uh, so yeah, I'm Prosper Maguchu, originally uh, from Zimbabwe, where I started my career as a human rights lawyer, uh, representing uh, victims of organized violence in Georgia. So it is from my uh, earlier work that I developed an, an interest in the relationship between corruption and human rights uh, abuses. So my presentation is the work that I've just recently started uh, trying to navigate or understand a watershed, as I said, in the, as, as, as it is referred in the, in the um, program uh, and the flyers, that I need to understand the relationship uh, between corruption and human rights violations, particularly civil and political rights, uh, especially in the context of uh, internet uh, shutdowns or cyber shutdowns. So uh, let me just give you a, okay, yeah. And I'll call this a WIMP's eye view of my presentation. So it's really from a humble perspective. What I intend to do in the next 15 or maybe 10 minutes is to briefly talk about the relationship between corruption and human rights. And in between that and the next part, I will also demystify some of the misconceptions or myths that are related to the topic on corruption and human rights abuses. Uh, then I will focus more on civil and political rights. And then of course, this will give me a way to discuss about uh, corruption and internet shutdowns. I want to discuss a few cases and then um, wrap up with uh, an, an interim conclusion. So if there are no violent objections, I will begin. Uh, but first, I, I thought I was going to give this presentation in, in person. And um, I had uh, prepared a quiz. Uh, I don't know now how if it's really possible to do it via, uh, online. But the first question I had was, uh, can someone tell you know, by one count how many number of shutdowns that have been experienced so far? especially when it's in regards to major political events. I'll just give away the answer. So according to an organization called uh, Keep It On, uh, between 2018 and 2020, there were about 564 shutdowns in the world, uh, mainly in, um, in the developing world, uh, with the longest one being in uh, Myanmar, which, took, uh, which lasted for about uh, five months. Okay, so I hope next time when we have an in-person um, a, a workshop, then I'll, I'll come up with something much interesting. But anyway, so uh, back to my presentation. I, I also thought that coming from the legal background and also dealing with uh, issues that are somehow more um, aligned to the black letter law, I just need to share a little bit about the methodology that I'm using to arrive at my conclusion, my interim conclusion. So I used two types of uh, met, me, uh, methods. Uh, the first one is uh, one that is associated with law, typically associated with law, uh, the doctrinal question. So I'm looking at the black letter law, in this case, looking at various pieces of legislation, including international instruments to see uh, if whether corruption can be conceptualized, can be understood as a violation of international human rights law. And the answer that I came uh, the interim conclusion is that yes, under certain circumstances, corruption can be viewed, can be seen as a human rights violation in and of itself. And I'll get into that uh, in a minute. Then I also employed uh, the normative uh, methodology, uh, mainly to answer the second question of my uh, research, uh, whether corruption should be, uh, or acts of corruption should be conceptualized as a human rights issues. To what end, to what benefit uh, do we get? What do we derive from uh, looking at corruption as a human rights violation? And again, of course, with some very, I mean, cautiously, I also come to the conclusion that uh, the benefits of looking at corruption or viewing corruption as a human rights violation far outweighs uh, you know, the skepticism 
of the anti, you know, Western agenda that she, uh, you know, corruption is seen as a disease of the global uh, South and so forth and so on. I will not get so much into detail in terms of methodology. Perhaps this is not the time and the question. So let me just go uh, and dispense with a few issues that I think are very important uh, for me to lay the background of my presentation. So one of the misconceptions, one of the myths that is usually associated with this topic of corruption and human rights, the relationship between corruption and human rights, is that corruption can actually be beneficial to human rights, to the enjoyment of human rights, especially in developing countries. If you look at countries like uh, uh, in African countries where you need to pay a bribe, uh, basically to get any essential services, uh, in the context of COVID-19, for instance, people had to pay a bribe to get vaccines, people had to pay bribes to be admitted in hospitals. You, you, you need to pay a bribe to basically get anything under, no, under normal circumstances. To get a passport to travel abro abroad or to, to enjoy a scholarship that you have secured abroad, you still need to pay somebody uh, in order to get a passport. Otherwise, it may take you three or four years if you have to do it properly. So some people have interpreted that uh, corruption under certain circumstances can be regarded as a benefit, as you know, can be regarded as, uh, as positive. But then again, I come to the conclusion that that is not, a, that's just a, a, a ridiculous to think that corruption is beneficial uh, to the enjoyment of human rights. That is an ed added tax you know, for the people who cannot afford in, in a case that's also can be regarded as discrimination. Because if you look at it from this perspective, let's look at this from, uh, let's look at it from this way. A person uh, approaches a hospital for some services and then the guard uh, looked at the person and, you know, to determine whether or how much they can get from the person in terms of a bribe. And if they consider that you may not be able to pay a bribe then they turn you away. That is discrimination. So that is against human rights uh, uh, principles. So corruption, and then no matter what circumstances cannot be beneficial uh, for the enjoyment of human rights. The second misconception that is also associated with the uh, relationship, the nexus between corruption and human rights is that corruption will lead to violation of human rights in all cases. So when we are saying that corruption can lead to the violation of human rights. We are not saying that every act of corruption is regarded as a human rights uh, violation. So that is not necessarily the case. Uh, there are certain circumstances under very specific conditions uh, can, on which we can safely say with authority uh, and certainty that corruption is a violation of human rights. And if you allow me some time, I'm going to get into that uh, by highlighting just a few examples uh, of cases under which corruption, various uh, uh, acts of corruption can be regarded as a human rights uh, violation. And the third misconception, then I'll deal with this, uh, I, I move on to the next topic, is uh, that when we talk about corruption and human rights, we are not necessarily, you know, arguing or advocating the creation of a new human right uh, which has been termed by other scholars and uh, commentators and practitioners as the fundamental freedom from corruption. So that is not the case. I think that would be ideal, of course, to have a fundamental uh, freedom from corruption, but I think it might not necessarily, well, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, I'm not necessarily pushing for a fundamental, uh, for a standalone uh, human right uh, of freedom from corruption. What I'm saying is that corruption is a violation of those rights that are already recognized, those rights that are already enshrined in various international instruments. And uh, with this, let me just show you uh, by way of a spectrum how corruption uh, can be viewed as a human rights uh, issue. Um, so there are various schools of thought. I think from the, the there's a weaker side of the spectrum. There are those uh, especially associated with the United Nations. If you read many United Nations documents, you find out that they use this very weak language, soft language, to describe the relationship between corruption and human rights. So they say corruption can have negative impact or it undermines the enjoyment of human rights, or that corruption can facilitate human rights as grave and devastating effect, so forth and so on. So they don't want to use the actual, uh, you know, wording that corruption is a violation of human rights. And uh, then we have scholars, 
uh, and uh, uh, I'm in good company. I, I, I belong to this uh, school of thought. I subscribe to this school of thought that corruption is a violation of human rights in and of, of itself under certain circumstances. Uh, but then there are others who actually took it much further, those who are arguing for freedom from corruption, and they believe that a careful or innovative reading of the existing uh, human rights treaties, uh, including uh, the United Nations uh, Declaration of Human Rights, uh, can actually uh, help you to come up with uh, a fundamental right that is called freedom from corruption. Um, again, as I said, that might sound a bit utopian. I believe that corruption is a violation of those existing human rights under certain circumstances. And I will use an example here uh, to show you, to illustrate how corruption can lead to the violation of human rights. So let's look at civil and political rights, for example. It basically, all, all fundamental rights, uh, all international instruments, uh, under, under various international instruments, states have uh, obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. And certain acts of corruption can lead to a violation of any one of these principles, sometimes all of these principles. Uh, let's take an example of um, a, a, a torture, which is the, the area that I practiced as a lawyer. Uh, so if a prison warder, or let's say a police officer has received a bribe uh, from a complainant uh, to force someone to admit to a crime they never committed. And then the police officer induced or used torture to, to, get, an, uh, to, to, to get a confession. A confession. That can be, so you can actually see a direct relationship between the act of paying a bribe uh, to an officer who then tortured uh, a citizen or a civilian to get a, a false admission. So there is actually a cause of connection. There is, there is no breaking connection. You can actually see the action, uh, the, uh, the paying of a bribe and the torture that is a result of uh, receiving a, a payment of a bribe. So there's actually a clear connection uh, of torture, of corruption and the violation of uh, freedom from torture. In this case, the officer fails to uh, respect the fundamental right uh, of a citizen, or he fails to this in, in, in another example. Let me move to another example. Another example could be, let's say, uh, to give an example of the socioeconomic rights. Um, socioeconomic rights can be enjoyed subject to the availability of resources. You know, so states have to fulfill uh, these human rights by providing uh, enough resources, let's say, to secure uh, uh, medication for their hospitals. If that money is not available because certain politicians are taking money away from where it's supposed to go and invest it in, in or divert it for their personal use, you can actually see again a cause of connection between actions of politicians and the denial of fundamental rights. So there are various ways I can give you different, uh, um, uh, several examples in which corruption can, acts of corruption can actually lead to a violation of human rights. And you can actually tell that there is the causal connection. And you can also attribute actions of either a, a state official, be it a minister or even a lower state official, a police officer manning a roadblock, or a police officer or a, a security guard uh, manning a, a hospital, how their actions, a corrupt acts, can still be attributed to the state. But I will not do that now. What I will do, what I, I want to explain a little bit more with regards to civil and political rights is that corruption for, uh, especially for political influence, can end in a violation of uh, a number of fundamental rights. So for instance, uh, you know, the right to vote, but also other human rights such as democracy, self-determination and so forth and so on. Uh, how can we then connect these to internet shutdowns? Uh, perhaps before I make the connection, uh, a little bit of explanation, maybe definition of what internet uh, shutdowns are. And uh, I'm sorry that I'm going to do a little bit of lecturing right here. I always try to avoid uh, what I call the disease of academia. Whenever academics are involved in a discourse of any sort, they want to start by giving definitions. I've tried to avoid, but I think it's important that I just give a little bit of pointers on what exactly I mean by internet shutdowns. So there are a few minutes left. 
Oh, okay, okay. So let me just quickly rush. Uh, so by internet shutdowns, I'm talking about, okay, so they can take different forms. For instance, uh, uh, blanket shutdowns, where you have a total internet blackout, access to the internet or, or any other form of telecommunication service is completely cut. You know, then there are also some, you know, specific uh, uh, targets where they target certain townships or certain networks and so forth. You know, like they, they, they just target WhatsApp, for instance, and then they can also just reduce uh, or slow down uh, the speed of internet, reduce it, downgrade it from 5G to 3G to 2G, making it uh, virtually impossible uh, for citizens, uh, inhabitants to upload, download, or even access information. So um, according to um, many uh, cases that I've reviewed for the purposes of this uh, research, most um, challenges that have been taken, most internet uh, shutdown challenges have focused on a certain number of rights, uh, the fundamental right uh, of freedom of expression and opinion, access to information, uh, assembly and association. Uh, so they say that because of internet shutdowns, it can hinder the full enjoyment of these uh, rights. Then again, remember what I said about the use of this soft language to say it does hinder something or it can facilitate the violation of uh, these rights. I want to come to an, a point where we can agree or we, I can actually show through research that internet shutdowns are not only just a threat, they don't just only hinder, but they can also be a direct violation of a number of human rights. So this is what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to review a number of cases. Some of them have been tried before domestic courts. Others have also been tried before uh, regional and uh, international courts. So I looked at a number of cases like the one in charge uh, unfortunately, this was dismissed. The court says the allegations were unfounded that an internet shutdown can lead to a violation of human rights. There's a second one, a second case that I'm also uh, currently looking at um, um, more interesting is the Zimbabwean case. Uh, this case, of course, was one. Uh, so the judge ruled that yes, indeed, the government's internet shutdown during some protests uh, was illegal. Uh, but then they didn't get to the merit uh, of the case. So they never really explained how exactly the government violated uh, human rights by shutting down internet uh, during such important uh, uh, political uh, uh, periods. There's another regional case, the one that has been launched by uh, the East African Law Society, I think on behalf of citizens and inhabitants of Uganda. The case is still under consideration, but there is a judgment already from another regional uh, economic court, uh, the ECOWAS, the Economic Court of West Africa, that is also ruled that uh, internet shutdowns in Togo in around, uh, I think around 2017, uh, was a violation of freedom of expression. So I want to see and then try to distinguish between these cases, how we can exactly, or how we can then come up to, you know, with a precedent that can help in future to, to regard uh, internet shutdowns as a violation of um, uh, fundamental rights, but not only that, and linking that to political corruption. Uh, so the conclusion that I, the interim conclusion so far is that, so despite all these cases, some of them that have been won, there's really not a single verdict that actually uh, deconstructs or explain the fundamental uh, relationship between political corruption, internet shutdowns, and the violation of a certain number of civil and political rights. Uh, so I come to the to my conclusion. I would really have loved to have more time so that I could have go. Uh, I could have explained some of the few uh, uh, the points in much more detail. But anyway, thank you very much for your attentive listening, and I uh, come to a conclusion. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. Anna has a question. Okay. Uh, Prosper. Um, let me mute myself. Uh, Prosper, um, thank you for the talk and uh, very interesting and also very different than uh, yeah the other talks, which is very nice also, I think, um, in terms of diversity, really. Um, but uh, I, I was wondering, so so what can be done against this corruption? If you, you, you mention, you study it, you analyze it, and you, you can say things about it from the legal perspective, but what can actually be uh, done um, about it as, mm -hmm. as, as, as citizens. Oh, yeah. 
Well, thank you very much for the clarification as citizens, because you know what can be done? How can we come up with solutions to corruption, whether it's political corruption or it's just petty corruption? It really depends on who, who are we talking to, who should address what. If we are talking about the parliaments, parliaments, they need to pass good laws, for instance, they need to pass laws that are strong enough to make sure that those who are corrupt will not escape accountability. Um, for citizens, well, there's quite a lot that they can do, but I think one of the things that have worked so far is putting pressure uh, on the political actors. So for citizens, they need to put pressure on political actors. For academics like ourselves, we need to keep on research and you know, get you know, research, those gray areas, help to shed light, to illuminate those blind spots where people might get away with corruption. So there are various I mean, ways in which we can address the issue of corruption, but then again, it really depends on who, which actor are we talking uh, to and uh, what is it exactly, what sort of corruption are we trying to uh, curb? Because we, we, when we're talking about corruption, it's important to distinguish it into its various categories. There is actually even not even a common understanding of what corruption is. So what we're dealing with are just perceptions. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I hope I you. answered you, yeah. yeah very nice. Yeah. Uh, and I would like to ask a, a lot more, but I think it's time now to, um, to move to the, to the break. Uh, Hans has just left for some reason. Uh, I don't know, but so I'm taking over the, the chair for a moment. And yeah, sorry yes, for- To, to uh, get something uh, from the outside. Okay. Well, okay. Was, uh, 15 minutes break. So let's have a 15 minutes break now. Uh, that means that we start again at um, uh, 20 past uh, 3. So thank you all and uh, have a nice tea break. <laughs> <laughs>